David. Um, Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, one of the, the wise men, or supposed wise men of the Silicon Valley, said that um, at our conference that uh, every company of more than 20 people needs to be a technology company. Is the International Rescue uh, company Committee, is that a, uh, a tech company? We have to be. I mean, we've got 12,000 people in the 35 most war-torn countries in the world, plus um, a, a significant staff in 22 US cities resettling new refugees into America. And so if you're asking, is technology important to our efficiency but also our impact, the answer is yes. And could we do much more to help change the lives of the 15 million people who we serve every year? Yes, we could. Give me specific examples of what you're doing now and how you'd like to improve. So we were founded by Einstein to rescue people from Western Europe in the 1930s. Now we are getting medical supplies into Syria so that people under bombardment can have primary health care. We're fighting Ebola in Sierra Leone, not just doing the treatment, but actually trying to prevent the spread of the disease. So the contact tracing technology is very, very important uh, to that. Uh, we are educating people in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, war-torn countries in but various technology ways. And so the technology there is about, in the Syria case, it's the barcodes to help make sure that our aid gets to the right places. In the Ebola case, it's the contact tracing to make sure that we're finding anyone who's been in contact with an Ebola patient. In Afghanistan and Pakistan, it's the, the tools to allow refugees to become the teachers of the refugee children. Now, the, the, the challenges fall into two categories. One, connectivity is a massive and costly issue. You know, we have 167 field offices. In Congo, it's thousands of times more expensive to connect than it is in New York. So there's a set of foundational issues. And a lot of our programs are about bringing technology and people together. And often that's a very difficult thing to do. So what needs to change? What do you want to do? Where would you like to be in a couple of years in well, terms of your use of technology? I'd need much more seamless and cheaper ways of connecting me and my people and the people that we serve. Is this a call to Silicon Valley, you saying that the technology doesn't exist or you simply aren't using it? I'm saying that for our people in Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, it has literally millions of displaced uh, people. For them to connect is not just intermittent, there's not just intermittent connection, it's incredibly expensive. So uh, that, that's the first issue. But the, the second issue is I want the well, engineers, let me just make the point, the, the engineers and the brilliant people of the valley, I want to inspire them that, with the idea that their knowledge can help solve some of the great problems facing the world. And it's not just about vaccines to tackle Ebola, it's also about mechanisms to trace and, and, and track and identify those with it. It's not just about Leban Syrian kids in Lebanon who need an education, it's how do you break the bureaucracy to give them an education. So I think that there are great projects that we need the engineers and the designers and the thinkers to come and help us with. What do you make, David, as, a, as an outsider, as someone who's dealing with a lot of misery in the world, with the utopian cheerfulness of Silicon Valley? Yeah, I think it's, I would call it can-do cheerfulness rather than uh, utopian. And it's good. I mean, it's, you know, I'm in a growth industry, and I'm afraid misery is a growth industry. But I've got a very strong view that if my sector, the humanitarian sector, one person is displaced from their homes by conflict or disaster every four seconds in the world at the moment. So it's a growth industry, but if we make ourselves an industry just of suffering rather than of solutions, we're not going to inspire people and we're not actually going to solve the problems. So I think we've got to be solutions-oriented, not suffering-oriented. What about the internet, David? Um, does that need to become less American for it to become more effective? I mean, I, don't, I think that if, you, if you're working with us in Africa, you don't think of the internet as American. I think you think of it as sort of it's stateless really. I don't think it's, I don't think one has to think of the internet as somehow being nationalized. There's obviously a danger that the internet becomes balkanized, that it becomes split and that would obviously be very damaging. But I think that when you, when you think that the, re, the modern refugee is in an urban area, not in a refugee camp, most refugees are in urban areas, not refugee camps, most refugees in, in the Syria context, they're, they're middle class people, they're technologically literate, they're not, and, and across Africa, they've got their cell phones, they may not have internet access, but they've got um, uh, their text connected. Uh, th it's a different world there, and these are tools or weapons of empowerment if we, if we use them right. What do you most worry about, about the impact of, of, of Silicon Valley network technology on traditional societies? Surveillance, privacy? 
You know, I worry about fragmentation quite a lot. The notion of national community gets broken down, that we only talk or listen or think with people who already agree with us. So I think there's a fragmentation issue. And although this isn't really a, a Western issue in quite the same way, I worry that the tools of technology are used to wage war more effectively than they are to wage peace. And so uh, that's an issue. You know, the, the, the consuming conflict in Syria now affecting over 10 million people and 10 million Syrians, the danger is that forces of nihilism and destruction are more effective at using technology than forces of a coexistence, pluralism, and peace. There's been a lot of calls and a lot of controversy about the way in which ISIS in particular is effectively using social media. Do you think that justifies calls for more censorship of the internet? I think that we, there is a, a tide really towards openness. And even those who are what censoring... What do you mean a tide? The, the, the tide is that the, I have this belief that the sweep of the open society is stronger than the attempts to put... To, to, to block it. And that's, now, a that's good not, tide. That's, it's a good tide. I don't want to underestimate the power of those who are trying to block it, but I think that the, 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 the open society has a stronger uh, dynamic and a stronger historical sense uh, about it. Now, in, in terms of, uh, I don't think we should glorify or, or uh, exaggerate the power of those who are trying to use the internet for malign uh, purposes. And um, things can go viral just because they are gory and ghastly, not because they're particularly brilliant. And I think one has to be aware of that. So I wasn't clear on your answer on that. Well, I'm deliberately not answering your question in specifically <laughs> about ISIS for a very particular reason, which is that we have staff working right across Syria, and I have to have at the front of my mind uh, that anything I say needs to be consistent with their safety and their position. But I think that the generic issue is that if you're, if you're saying, look, the internet can be used for malign purposes as well as benign or empowering ones, that's obviously true. But I, I don't think that the answer to that then is to try to somehow step back. You've got to ride the wave of openness, not try and block it. David, you have a background also very well known in party politics, British party politics. Uh, should Reid Hoffman's 20-person uh, rule be applied to party politics in the UK, especially the party perhaps you're most familiar with. What do we need to do in terms of turning politics upside down, modernizing it? I think that you can't think about politics unless you think about government. So it's two sides of the same coin. Politics is the entry ticket into government, at least in democratic societies. And I think that political parties have become very effective at micro-targeting of voters. Governments have become much more conscious of their day-to-day -day accountability, not just their four or five yearly accountability to, to voters. And technology has helped facilitate that. But I think that for, for politics, the, the, the kind of things that inspire me, I created a, a social movement called Movement for Change, which is a community organizing movement, which is in part about using social media, but also personal contact to mobilize people to help solve problems. And I think that part of our language of empowerment suggests that people don't have power and we've got to give it to them. Uh, the, the founding idea of Movement for Change is that people do have power, but it's disorganized and it's not being mobilized. And that's the perspective that I think is important in, in politics, both party politics and movement politics more generally. Does it worry you that we're empowering people more as consumers than as citizens? I think that who's the we is the question there. And I think that people are empowering themselves and they're partly using it to shop online but they're also using it to connect online, and they're connecting for social reasons as well as um, economic reasons. Look, who, how do we know about chemical weapon attacks in Syria? We knew about it through social media. And we knew about it because people were using social media to sound the alarm. And that's a good thing. Final question, David. 1989, the anniversary this week uh, of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Francis Fukuyama famously said that history had come to an end. Um, when we look back 25 years, do you think that we are going to see 1989 critically as the year that Berners-Lee invented the web as opposed to the fall of the Berlin Wall? Is the network society the key um, narrative of the early 21st century as opposed to the end of the Cold War? But in a way, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall is the triumph of the network society. I mean, obviously, it wasn't, the fall of Berlin Wall wasn't caused by the uh, ideas that founded the internet. But in a way, it's a demonstration that walls get broken. 
and that's the founding idea of the network society. I mean, it's striking that the organization that went into um, the, the pressure that ultimately brought down the, the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union and its allies, um, was about openness and accountability and expression. And the, the hands that, were, that reached across the wall to, to reunite the divided Berlin was the ultimate physical networking that I think was, is quite a good symbol of what the network society should be about. And if we can build a global village that has the same kind of unity as the united Berlin, uh, then it'll be a better world. Thank you so much, David. Thank you very much.